Right, so this uh, lecture is about the circuits which are inside the cerebellum. Uh, for this lecture, you need to have a pretty good understanding of the afferents uh, and the efferents of the cerebellum. That is, uh, what type of fibers are coming into the cerebellum, afferents, and from where are they coming? Because that will give you an idea of, uh, the source will give you the idea what cerebellum uh, will will do with, uh, with this information that these afferents are bringing in. And then, of course, efferents is more obvious is the output of the of the cerebellum uh, so the, the previous lecture to this one is instructive before uh, you watch uh, this particular uh, uh, lecture in this uh, based on what we have discussed in the an uh, anatomy lecture we will go into the cerebellum and see uh, how do different fibers interplay with each other we call it uh, the word is circuits uh, so there's a there's a pretty interesting circuitry of the cerebellum uh, which is based on the afferents and the efferents and we will now be looking at that so in the inner working of cerebellum is here it goes right so this is a diagram from Guyton and we'll, we'll be uh, referring to it extensively now for, for this slide uh, what 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 uh, let me just walk you through it uh, this is the first uh, part of the circuits concept cerebellar circuits concept and here we'll discuss the functional unit of cerebellum now the functional unit of cerebellum is the Purkinje cell deep nucleus combo what is that just to give you a snapshot of what we are talking about is this is it okay this 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 red box here it houses the black colored Purkinje cell together with its uh, uh, all sorts of uh, protrudings and its exon which terminates on a, a corresponding deep nucleus and I've mentioned this in the anatomy and then that deep nucleus uh, forms the efferents of the cerebellum as mentioned in the anatomy lecture again. So. Uh, this is the func uh, functional unit of the cerebellum as far as the inner circuitry is concerned okay now we will start by looking at the two afferents that are in when i say afferents now what i mean is when all those afferents the three major afferents from the brain and the two major afferents from the spinal cord when they come and and they 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 enter uh, the cerebellum uh, they are sorted out they are categorized into two main afferents okay so all that information comes into the cerebellum and is processed uh, by two main fibers two main summary afferents if you want to call them this may uh, cause some confusion uh, that we are calling these uh, afferents as well the climbing fiber and the Mosi fiber okay these are also called afferents and that stuff is also called afferent but it's very clear that all of that stuff which is coming from different parts of the brain uh, and different parts of the body once it is available to the cerebellum cerebellum has its own internal circuitry so all that uh, data which comes in is sorted out along two lines one line is called one line is called the climbing fiber the other is called mossy fiber okay this is their story so this is the climbing fiber first we'll do the climbing fiber let me just mark it here so this is the climbing fiber this is what i'm talking about this is the mossy fiber which we'll talk about after we've discussed climbing fiber all right okay so as you can see that this is an input fiber just like this so its input the climbing fiber that is the data that it receives and and proceeds and and gives it to the cerebellum for onward processing comes from inferior olive inferior olivary nucleus in the brain stem now in inferior olives uh, uh, obviously one uh, one would be curious 
where do they get their data from? They get their data from big names. So uh, cere uh, cerebral motor cortex, basal ganglia, uh, uh, widespread areas of the reticular formation and spinal cord, anything left. All the major actors, they send uh, branches into this, this very important place in the brainstem called the inferior olivary nucleus. Okay, And from this, the, a, a big bandwidth of data then enters into the cerebellum, which is taken up inside the cerebellum by the climbing fiber. So I hope that is clear now. The, the flow of information is clear to you now. So just, just follow my cursor here. So this climbing fiber literally sort of climbs towards the cortex via the uh, parsing through the deep side of the cerebellum. And here, before it climbs on to uh, its destination, uh, here it gives out a, 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 a branch, a stimulatory branch, mind you, to the deep nucleus, to its deep nucleus, whatever relevant deep nucleus it has, it will give a the uh, branch of that deep nucleus okay uh, there are several uh, climbing fibers and all of them will give this stimulatory fiber to several deep nuclei okay we are just targeting one for simplification so with this noted duly noted let's let's see what it does further it climbs on further okay and look at what is happening here here it uh, gives lots of branches to the dendrites of the Prakanji cell. Okay. Now, uh, each each climbing fiber can and can service up to uh, five to ten Prakanji cells through these extensive branches. Okay, uh, and several of deep nuclei. So, one uh, climbing fiber, several. Uh, deep nuclei and one climbing fiber is uh, for uh, is is uh, gives branches to five to ten Purkinje cells. Okay, this is uh, to to give you a holistic picture of uh, the potential of a climbing fiber. Okay, and again there will be many climbing fibers which will deal with many deep nuclei and many Purkinje cell. But if you want to talk about one, then I have given you those statistics. Okay, now. These, this is a very interesting place and a very busy place actually. So the many synapses that happen here with the Purkanji dendrites, they can go up to 300 synapses. So each climbing fiber has about, a, a, about 300 synapses with each of its Purkanji cell. Remember, it will field 5 to 10 Purkanji cells, right? So with each, it will have about 300-ish uh, uh, synapses. Uh, goes to show you how extensive uh, uh, is, is the nature of the climbing fiber interacting with the uh, Purkinje cell. Okay, and mind you, it's a direct linkage. If you can quickly notice what the Mosi fiber is doing, it is uh, communicating with the Purkinje cell indirectly through the granular cell. Something to note. A very similar stimulatory branch is given to the deep nucleus similar to the climbing fiber however the climbing fibers uh, interaction with Purkinje is direct uh, as compared to the mozi fiber via the granular cell okay back to the climbing fiber now what happens what happens is if you stimulate this climbing fiber once what will happen what will happen is it will give off uh, it, it will stimulate the deep nucleus because of this branch here right branch here that's not the dramatic part the dramatic and the peculiar action potential called the complex uh, 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 complex spike is what happens here so what happens here is per stimulation per stimulation of the climbing fiber initially uh, the action potential that is generated inside the cortex, i.e. on top of the Purkinje cells, is uh, strong. It starts off with a strong action potential. But then it dwindles off and comes to, uh, uh, comes to a trough. And the rest of the action potential is really a, a, a how do you call it, a weakening uh, uh, secondary spikes. 
so the primary spike is strong while there are a lot of secondary spikes which are of low intensity this is a very peculiar sort of action potential it has a name and we call it the complex spike remember climbing fiber is to do with complex spike okay so if i say it in another way it will stimulate the deep, uh, deep nucleus while it's moving towards its uh, destination ultimate destination with this stimulated this will now first strongly stimulate the dendrites i.e stimulating the Purkinje cell strongly followed by a sustained weak stimulation of the Purkinje cell this is a very important point if that is done Purkinje cell as I mentioned earlier is an inhibitory cell right now this is in again in the anatomy lecture okay now since it's inhibitory in nature it secretes GABA it inhibits the deep nucleus so to complete what's going on here right here is the form let me just clear out the rest so that you don't get confused so i will give it a unique color let's say green okay what's happening here what is happening here is first the deep nucleus first the deep nucleus gets stimulated by the climbing fiber stimulative twig or fiber or branch right followed by a few a, a few a, a small amount of time afterwards a strong stimulation a strong uh, inhibition by the Purkinje cell on the same deep nucleus followed by a sustained uh, low intensity inhibition by the Purkinje cell I'm just following the complex spike okay so if you are sitting in the deep nucleus first you will feel the a lot of positivity as soon as a new action potential goes through the climbing fiber naturally then after a while you'll get a tug of inhibition followed by a sustained inhibition okay so uh, uh, finally if you are monitoring the efferent activity of this deep nucleus there will be a spike in its uh, activity followed by a sharp decrease followed by a sustained low intensity decrease of its output i hope you followed that all three renditions of the same phenomena right now we'll talk about the mosey fiber let me just mark it we are now talking about the most oops sorry the mossy fibers okay what do they do well first what is their source where where are they getting their data from okay all other afferents whatever is left so it can be the cortex it can be uh, the brainstem it can be the body uh, which what, whatever is left from the inferior olivary uh, nucleus the rest is 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 sent via the mossy fibers and and it it does a very similar thing it first stimulates uh, it, uh, whatever respective uh, deep nucleus and then it goes on uh, and synapses with uh, granular cells now granular cells I've already uh, mentioned um, and there are hundreds to thousands of granular cells uh, for uh, for these for these synapses okay uh, hundreds and thousands of them and I mentioned that granular cells are so numerous in in their number that they actually outnumber the total neurons of the cerebral cortex this is again in the anatomy lecture okay um, then what happens is uh, something interesting uh, granular cells then send very small uh, up to less than a less than one micrometer diameter exons into the molecular layer okay these exons then form parallel fibers i.e horizontal fibers okay inside the molecular layer uh, and they extend and and they do their business which is many millions of synapses with their respective Purkinje cells okay uh, there's a statistic is the, a, 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 an interesting statistic is 500 to 1000 granular cells for every Purkinje for every one Purkinje cell is available so you can imagine the number of synapses that go on in the molecular layer between the granular cells which are instigated by the mossy fibers 
and the targeted uh, Prakanji cell. On the action potential front, this is a totally different game uh, that happens uh, with the climbing fiber. With the MOSI fiber, granular cell interface, uh, since gra granular cells project very small exons, uh, a lot of them need to be activated simultaneously to uh, affect the targeted Purkanji cell, as you can imagine. Climbing fiber is a strong fiber. It handles uh, many Purkanji cells per climbing fiber. And uh, really opposite to this is lots and lots and lots of granular cells. Uh, so 500 to 1000 granular cells per Purkanji cell uh, through 80,000 to 200,000 synapses are required to move a Purkanji cell. To, to activate it. So you can imagine the difference here. And this is obviously, it's all by design and nothing is by coincidence, okay? Uh, and in, the, in, this, uh, in this fashion, the action potential that is generated is a simple spike, okay? And not the, the complex spike of uh, climbing fiber. It's a simple spike, uh, a simple action potential, which is uh, triggered by the MOSI fibers. Okay, so overall, the Prakanji uh, cell fires uh, between uh, 50 to 100 action potential uh, per second. Uh, however, the output, the action potentials uh, per unit time of deep nuclei are, is much higher. Uh, finally, both of these firing rates can be modulated upwards or downwards, depending on their afferents, i.e. climbing fiber and MOSI fiber activity. So in summary, uh, this combo between the deep nuclei and Prakanji cells uh, is such that there is continuous uh, firing of the deep nuclei. You can understand it like the deep nuclei are more active in their activity than the Prakanji cells. Uh, so uh, in normal quiet state, uh, routine life, the deep nuclei are in a constant state of excitation and they they discharge continuously okay uh, this is punctuated by the Prakanji cells uh, which uh, 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 which keeps the deep nuclei from overacting or overshooting uh, their action potentials and keeps the, the the system real and keeps it within physiological range okay but the balance is tilted towards the uh, deep nuclei firing with a uh, measured nuanced inhibition from the Prakanji cells. This is when uh, we are at rest. During rapid movements, which by the way the cerebellum is specialized in, uh, the ballistic movements, repetitive movements which, are, which occur at a very high speed, this is what we mean by rapid movements. Uh, what happens? What happens is uh, the input through via the uh, afferent and the mainly the uh, climbing fiber what happens is there is the initial strong stimulation of the deep nucleus which is already had its uh, direct stimulation from climbing and MOSI both fibers the direct stimulation so initial discharge of the uh, deep uh, nuclei is a lot during rapid movements followed by a few milliseconds of when the Prakanji comes to the play and it inhibits or it dampens the excitation of the overly stimulated deep nuclear. This is the kind of delay line negative feedback which is very important and which is characteristic of the circuit of the cerebellum. Initially strong output from the cerebellum augments the cerebral cortex in uh, solidifying that motor movement that it triggered okay and since it's a fast uh, uh, motion uh, the cerebral cortex don't doesn't have time to adjust it just sends who adjusts who reinforces it uh, fine tunes it it's the cerebellum through its its circuitry so again the deep nucleus because it's it gets stimulated first as i just explained the the uh, as soon as it's additionally stimulated during a fast movement that additional 
punch that comes from the uh, cerebellar efferents adds to the uh, motor cortex effort to uh, to 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 uh, to initiate and maintain this fast motor movement uh, followed a few milliseconds afterwards by the perkanji induced inhibition of this of this grand stimulation so the net the net result is that uh, by this uh, delay line negative feedback is that overshooting of or uh, uh, overarching or any exaggerated motor movements are restricted by this inhibition if this inhibition the, the perkanji induced inhibition wasn't there you would have um, you would have movements overshooting their intended target so if i were to touch this camera here i would be touching it but going beyond this is called pass pointing and you will will do will will study this in cerebellar disorders and in cerebellar disorders you will see that it doesn't stop at the intended mark it actually overshoots this is what uh, the perkanji fiber does it regulates the movement it it shows you where to stop okay so that's that that's about this slide the second explanation uh, of these circuits is really an application of what we have just discussed in terms of the cerebellar circuit uh, and and that discussion really links into this particular slide because the turn on and turn off of agonists and turn off and turn on of the antagonists uh, it's a tongue twister not really well if you if you want to do a movement so if you want to uh, flex the bicep the agonist needs to be switched on and the antagonist needs to be switched off and at the end of the movement when you want to go back to its original situation you want to switch off the agonist and switch on the antagonist right but what if you want to do this uh, at a pretty rapid rate in a short period of time again those rapid ballistic movements that is the function of cerebellum we can't do ballistic movements unless we have intact cerebellums in fact initially they couldn't figure out what the function of cerebellum really was uh, before they worked out where, that when a lesion occurs in the cerebellum not only does the person becomes a bit wobbly uh, balance and equilibrium etc the chap cannot do uh, uh, rapid movements like like this or this i'm sure you can't do this either but anyway the rapid movements right walking running all of that which 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 involves uh, switching on and switching off of multiple muscle groups in rapid succession of time okay and one muscle group goes into contraction the other is going into uh, 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 into relaxation it has to because it is the antagonist muscle to keep track of all of this in real time cerebellar circuits cerebellum okay so the mozi uh, fiber activity is an example uh, I, i've discussed this in in detail that initially uh, the the stimulation of the deep nucleus gives the added punch to the original motor output so just when you start a new activity motor activity initially that motor activity is weak only a few milliseconds afterwards when the cerebellum kicks in and sends in its uh, uh, its uh, added uh, signal uh, we've discussed this just a few milliseconds afterwards that particular motor movement becomes augmented and stronger in the absence of cerebellum it will stay weaker it, it the, the 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 help won't come okay obviously um, and after a while this this self sustained circuit will inhibit itself and bring bring the whole thing down to normal contraction because initially sometimes uh, you want to have more strength or more motor input into starting a movement but when it hits inertia or it hits that 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 patch where it's not really required extra extra stuff is not required a mundane signal would do then the cerebellum equalizes the force and it by inhibiting via the perkanji system that i mentioned uh, so this uh, turn on sorry where is my marker this turn on turn off of the agonist and turn off turn on of the antagonist is a classical example of how cerebellar circuits work 
the stimulation delayed inhibition all that stuff uh, the new thing here is the Prakanji system remembers it learns through its uh, uh, actions the best example is remember the time that you could not drive uh, could not ride a bike and then with rehearsal important is rehearsal with rehearsal you fell down a, a couple of times or maybe more times uh, but then you got back on and um, you worked out exactly you can tell I, I know how to ride a bike you could tell by the sway of the of the body on top of that seat uh, that I have to be just in the middle and it should be okay and the weight of the body pins the cycle down the bicycle down and you're good to go this is becomes automatic as you rehearse okay how does it become automatic it's because the cerebellum learns it it learns by the motor error so initially we may uh, put in too much effort into into a movement uh, which is which was a necessary uh, or we may uh, use too less of force okay so it remembers by matching the efference copy mentioned earlier it keeps on matching and remembering so it learns as it goes along this is what was required for uh, cerebral circuits I, I think we've burned the whole topic and uh, that is that.